Good morning. Welcome to Impact. My name is Deborah G, and I'm the Community Life Director here at Impact. So this is the last message in this series, Well Versed. You've had a chance to hear from our staff about the verses that have truly impacted their lives. We've heard from Ronnie about grace, and we also heard from him about resp being responsible for our race. We've heard from Anthony in Psalms about talking about God being our shepherd. We've heard from Kevin in the book of Matthew, talking about not getting stuck in the dead water anymore. We've heard from Brennan, we learned that God is good. A little bit louder than that usually for the VBS kids, but you guys know, right? You remember that? And then we heard from Dustin, and all I can think about is God's got a big butt. You guys remember that? <laughs> Those of you who here for that week, but really he was talking about first kings and being willing to do what God asks of us. And then this last week, we talked, Mike talked about having faith to move mountains. So for me, the book of Esther has always been that intriguing book. It's a true fairy tale about an ordinary girl who becomes queen and saves her people. There's even a happy ending in everything. The romantic in me loves the idea, but it is so much more than that. It's about the providence of God and his care for his people. It also carries this theme of the sovereignty of God and how he uses people to accomplish his purposes. One of the parts of the book of Esther that has historically caused many discussions is that God is never mentioned anywhere in the book. Yet as I share with you Esther's story, you'll begin to see God's hand of protection over us throughout her and through her story, how God chooses, lets us use our free will to choose to do things that are far out of our comfort zone that will bring him glory and will fulfill his purpose. Probably most of you have heard of the story of Esther or have you read through the book, but I'd like to do a quick overview of this story. The book kind of reads like a, a, a story, a fairy tale that you would read, slowly introduces the characters and how they relate. It's very descriptive and poetic, and if you've never read it, I'd love for you to take a chance to read this after uh, this week and go through that, and just, just because you've been prompted through the story to, to read it. So it opens up with King Xerxes. He's the king at the time, and he is over the Persian Empire, which was a very vast and, and um, wide range from Iran to Egypt, all these in-between places. So he was quite a big, uh, massive area that he was in charge of. And he was well known for these banquets that he would have. And the book opens up with him having this six month banquet. And if you want more descriptions, you can read the story of it. It has a lot of great detail about the banquets. And he invited his nobles, his leaders, his military leaders to these banquets. And then after that, it talks about this seven day banquet that he had where he invited some of the people in the town to come to the banquet as well. And it says there was free flowing wine. So you can imagine their state of mind after this six month banquet and then this week long banquet of this free flowing wine. At the same time, his queen, Queen Vashti, she was having a banquet as well for the women in another part of the palace. And you can imagine that the king and all of this, uh, with all this free flowing wine that we've been talking about, he decides to invite Queen Vashti to come and be paraded before all of his men at his banquet. Well, she refuses to go to the banquet and be paraded around. And because of that, because of those actions, he chooses then to dethrone Vashti from that position because of her disobedience to him. So later, the king and his leaders are talking. They're trying to come up with a way to acquire a new queen. So they begin a search for beautiful young virgins in the, in the area that they're at. And it says, then let the girl who pleases the king be queen instead of Vashti. So now enters into the story Esther, who is one of the women who is brought to the palace at this time. And it says she was lovely in form and feature. And Esther immediately wins the favor of those around her in the palace. Uh, she is given seven maids to help care for her and put in a special place away from everyone else. And, but during this time, according to her uncle Mordecai, she is not to give away her heritage, her Jewish heritage. Don't tell anyone about it is what he tells her. Mordecai is her cousin who has adopted her because she is an orphan. 
So then Esther goes into this 12-month period of beauty treatments. Ladies, can you imagine 12 months of beauty treatments? I'd like an hour of beauty treatments. And they went through these 12 months of beauty treatments to then be presented to the king. So they got oils and cosmetics and perfumes during this time. So then Esther, after this year-long treatment, then goes before the king. And in chapter 2, verse 17, it says, Now the king was attracted to Esther more than to any of the other women, and she won his favor and approval more than any of the other virgins. So he set a royal crown on her head and made her queen instead of Vashti. So here she is now, queen of this palace. But Mordecai still continues to come and visit her and check in on her and again remind her, don't tell of your heritage, do not tell them that you're a Jew. So Mordecai is there quite often within the king's gates and around and, and watching over her and caring for her. And at one point he hears the two king's guards who are plotting an assassination against the king. So he immediately goes and tells Esther and Esther goes and tells the king. And then that event was recorded in the books of the history of the King Xerxes reign. So now this is where the bad guy enters into the story. Dun, 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 Haman, bad guy. He enters into the scene, he's second in command, and per the king's orders, those who see him are supposed to bow down to him every time he walks by them. Mordecai, he won't bow down. He's a Jew, he refuses to bow down. And this happens day after day. And it just makes Haman enraged. Every time he sees him, he just gets more enraged and more enraged with Mordecai. So Haman finds out that Mordecai is a Jew. And it says in chapter three of verse six, Haman decided not to do away with Mordecai alone. He planned to destroy all of Mordecai's people, the Jews. So Haman then goes to the king and convinces him that killing the Jews is in the best interest of the king and gets him to sign a decree that all the Jews will be destroyed on a certain date later on in the year. Well, you can imagine the sadness that filling that land of all those Jews who are there. Mordecai tells Esther about this and he says to her, that she needs to go and approach the king, implore him, and to personally um, plead with him for her people. But Esther, she reminds Mordecai that it's against the law to go to the king without him requesting her. She said, if only the king extends his gold scepter, will that person live? And this is kind of the key verse of the whole theme of Esther, and it's in verse 14 of chapter 4, and Mordecai replies back to her, if you keep silent at this time, liberation and deliverance will come to the Jewish people from another place, but you and your father's house will be destroyed. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. So I know that Esther is probably pondering all of these thoughts and thinking through them. So she goes back to Mordecai and she says, Fast with me, tell your Jewish friends to fast in, with me for three days and three nights, and I and my servants will fast for those three days and those three nights. And then after that period of time, I'll go to the king, even though it's against the law. And she resigned herself and she said, if I perish, I perish. So after those three days, Esther goes to the king. He extends that gold scepter to her, and she, so she invites Haman and the king to a banquet. So at this banquet, the king asks her, what is it that you want? What, I'll give you half the kingdom. And she says, I'd like you to have another banquet with me the next night. I always wondered there why she said that. Maybe it was nerves or anxiousness about it, but she did invite them again to that second night for a banquet. So Haman leaves the banquet this first night and he is just full of himself, so proud that he's been invited to this banquet with only the king, the queen and himself. He's truly excited to be there. He walks out of the king gates and, well, there's Mordecai. St just sitting right there, not bowing down to him, nothing. And he becomes enraged. So he goes home, talks with his family, and he builds a gallows that he's going to hang Mordecai on for not bowing down to him. That same night, though, after the banquet, the king, he goes back to his rooms and he can't sleep. So he has them pull out the books of the history of his reign and he has them read it to him. And as they're reading it to him, he is reminded of how Mordecai has thwarted this whole assassination plan to kill him. And he remembers that he was, Mordecai was never rewarded for this. So when Haman comes in the next morning thinking he's going to kill Mordecai, the king says to Haman, 
You need to take Mordecai around on my horse with my robes on and say, this is what is done for the man the king delights to honor, which he did. But you can imagine how Haman felt in those moments of just that anger and bitterness that he already felt towards Mordecai. And here he has, he's having to parade him around the capital saying these things about him. But that evening again, both Haman and the king come back to the banquet that second evening. And that's when the Queen Esther tells him about the plot against her life and the Jewish people. And of course, the king becomes enraged when he finds this all out. And he has Haman hung on the same gallows that he had built for Mordecai. And Esther then tells the king who Mordecai is and has um, that their, what their relationship is. And the king gives Haman's position back to Mordecai to be in. Esther then and Haman are allowed to write a new decree that allows the Jewish people to protect themselves when those who are going to come against them to kill them. So they're allowed to protect themselves. And they do. And that's how the Jewish people were saved from their destruction. What a great story. God's purposes are accomplished through his people. And he loves and he cares for his people. When Mike had asked me to share and told me what the topic was, this verse from Esther came to my mind. And who knows but that you have come to your royal position for such a time as this. I've always felt that God has put me in different roles and positions in my life for his purpose. And as we see in the story of Esther, and here's your first fill in, God uses ordinary people for his purpose. He uses ordinary people for his purpose. I'm going to read Esther 2, verse 7. Mordecai had a cousin named Hadassah, whom he had brought up because she had neither father nor mother. This young woman, who was also known as Esther, had a lovely figure and was beautiful. Mordecai had taken her as his own daughter when her father and mother died. So here's Esther and Mordecai. Esther is an orphan. Her parents have died. Her older cousin Mordecai is taking care of her. Nothing special about them. They're just living within the customs of their culture. They had moved into that area centuries before when their ancestors were brought, taken from Jerusalem and they were exiled there, so they had been slaves. And they were, but they were just happy and living there in that area. Nothing out of the ordinary. I, I didn't think that they even imagined how, in their wildest dreams, how God was going to use them in the months to come and how he was going to use them to save his people. But I can relate to that idea of God using ordinary people for his purpose because I'm an ordinary girl. I grew up in a Christian home, was always a good girl. My sister, she can attest to that. Got married, had three kids, nothing special or out of the ordinary, just living my daily life. But I've also had the heartache of losing loved ones, the struggles of parenting, depression, rough patches in my marriage, financial struggles, bad choices and decisions that I've made. And yet God has used me for his purpose. It might not have been in such a drastic way as Esther, as saving her people. But looking back, I've been able to see times where I've shared a part of my story that's encouraged someone else. There have been times when God has clearly told me to stop and take food to a homeless person that I've passed on the street. That's God using ordinary me to fulfill his purposes. There have even been times when I've been struggling in my own life spiritually and God still wants to use me. During those moments, I feel useless and it reminds me that he can use me where I'm at if I'm willing. We're all ordinary people with different backgrounds, different stories, and lots of baggage. But God wants to use our ordinariness for his purpose. The second point is that God directs people's actions to accomplish his purpose. He directs his, our actions to accomplish his purpose. I'm going to read in Esther 2. It says, During the time Mordecai was sitting at the king's gate, Bigthana and Teresh, two of the king's officers who guarded the doorway, became angry and conspired to assassinate King Xerxes. But Mordecai found out about the plot and told Queen Esther, who in turn reported it to the king, giving credit to Mordecai. And when the report was investigated and found to be true, the two officials were impaled on poles. All this was recorded in the book of the annals in the presence of the king. I believe that God had put Mordecai at the king's gate that day at the right moment to hear the assassination plan. He ultimately used Mordecai to protect the king. And if you remember later on in the story when the king is reminded of Mordecai thwarting the assassination plot, he uses evil Haman to parade Mordecai around the capital telling how he'd saved the king's life. Have you ever been in a place 
that you hadn't really planned on going and God used you to help someone. Or maybe you've been somewhere and you saw a person that you didn't know was going to be there and had this amazing conversation and just knew that that was a God-ordained moment. It might be that God directed you there for just that moment to be able to listen to someone's heartache or share from your resources. Or maybe he puts you in that place to share a story that someone needed to hear. Well, that's kind of what God had done with Mordecai. He'd put him in that place to hear about the assassination plot because God will direct our actions for his purpose. But there's more than that to the story because God uses an obedient heart for his purpose as well. That's your next fill in. He uses an obedient heart for his purpose. In Esther 4, it says, Then Esther sent this reply to Mordecai, Go gather together all the Jews who are in Susa and fast for me. Do not eat or drink for three days, night or day. I and my attendants will fast as you do. When this is done, I will go to the king, even though it is against the law. And if I perish, I perish. So this is just after Mordecai has told Esther that she might be in her position for such a time as this. So my thought is that Esther truly realizes in this moment that she needs to be obedient to the calling God had on her life. She carefully listened to Mordecai's words and realized that God would use her if she followed his leading in her life. It definitely required her to step out in faith. And she fully realized that those next steps that she was going to take could end her life. Obedience often requires sacrifice. She was willing to sacrifice her life for his purpose. I think one of the keys to her obedience was her time of fasting. We can assume here that that time was spent in prayer and meditation as well. Fast, fasting is usually done for a specific purpose. Many people have fasted and prayed before making a big decision or maybe fast, fasted to focus on spending time hearing from God. Whatever the reason, fasting helps bring into focus the seriousness of the situation and the willingness to listen for direction, as you'll hear in these next few verses that I read from Esther. Esther chapter 5. On the third day, so this is after she's fasted, Esther put on her royal robes and stood in the inner court of the palace in front of the king's hall. The king was sitting on his royal throne in the hall, facing the entrance. When he saw Queen Esther standing in the court, he was pleased with her and held out to her the gold scepter that was in his hand. So Esther approached and touched the tip of the scepter. Then the king asked, what is it, Queen Esther? What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be given you. Her willingness to obey and seek out the king is what eventually saved her people from destruction. I believe in that moment, she most likely truly grasped why God had allowed her to be queen and what God's purpose was for her. Because of Jesus, we also have the ultimate example of sacrificial obedience. If you know the story of when Jesus lived on the earth, he was a fully human man. He didn't want to be crucified on the cross, but he did for our sins because he was obedient to the Father. It is the ultimate example of our obedient heart for God's purpose. In Esther 5, we can also see that God can use something that is meant for bad for his purpose. He takes those bad things and turns them into his purpose. In Esther chapter 5, it says, Haman went out that day happy and high in spirit. So this is right after that first banquet. But when he saw Mordecai at the king's gate and observed that he had neither rose nor showed fear in his presence, he was filled with rage against Mordecai. Nevertheless, Haman restrained himself and went home. Calling together his friends and Zeresh his wife, Haman boasted to them about his vast wealth, his many sons, and all the ways the king had honored him, and how he had elevated him above the other nobles and officials. And that's not all, Haman added. I'm the only person Queen Esther invited to accompany the king to the banquet she gave, and she's invited me along with the king tomorrow. But all this gives me no satisfaction as long as I see that Jew Mordecai sitting at the king's gate. His wife Zeresh and all his friends said to him, have a pole set up reaching to a height of 50 cubits and ask the king in the morning to have Mordecai impaled on it. Then go with the king to the banquet and enjoy yourself. This suggestion delighted Haman and he had the pole set up. What a great guy, huh? So here Haman in his anger against Mordecai has set up a gallows to kill him. So the plot thickens, the bad guy has an evil plan, but God uses it for his purpose. The next day at the banquet, Esther tells the king of her plight and it changes. 
in Esther chapter 7. Then, the queen, then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life, this is my petition, and spare my people, this is my request. For I and my people have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. If we had merely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet, because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, Who is he? Where is he? The man who has dared to do such a thing. Esther said, An adversary and enemy, this vile Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. The king got up in a rage, left his wine, and went out into the palace garden. But Haman, realizing that the king had already decided his fate, stayed behind to beg Queen Esther for his life. Just as the king returned from the palace garden to the banquet hall, Haman was falling on the couch where Esther was reclining. The king exclaimed, Will he even molest the queen while she is with me in the house? As soon as the words left the king's mouth, they, they covered Haman's face. Then Harbona, one of the eunuchs attending the king, said, A pole reaching to a height of 50 cubits stands by Haman's house. He had it set up for Mordecai, who spoke up to help the king. The king said, Impale him on it. So they impaled Haman on the pole he had set up for Mordecai. Then the king's fury subsided. Haman was truly evil and full of himself, and he wanted Mordecai to die along with all the other Jews. He plotted to kill Mordecai on the gallows, but the gallows is what ended up being used on him. This part of the story of God using something bad for his purpose always reminds me of the Old Testament story of Joseph. If you remember, Joseph is the youngest of several brothers, and um, he is also the favored one of their dad, and he's forever telling them these stories about dreams he's had of how one day they will bow down to him, and of course, the brothers just hate him for this. And they eventually sell him into slavery. And years, so years and years go by, and the brothers go to Egypt to get help because their land is in famine. They don't recognize Joseph, but he recognizes them. And when, they, when he tells them who he is, they're very afraid. But I love this verse in Genesis 50, verse 20. It says, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good to accomplish what is now being done, the saving of many lives. So God can use things that are meant for bad for his purpose. Max Lucado, an author, that I read a quote from him recently said, in God's hands, intended evil becomes eventual good. And my last point has to do that with God can give ordinary people extraordinary influence to accomplish his purpose. He gives people extraordinary influence to accomplish his purpose. And we see this coming into play in the last chapters of Esther. In Esther chapter 8, it says, That same day, King Xerxes gave Queen Esther the estate of Haman, the enemy of the Jews. And Mordecai came into the presence of the king, for Esther had told how he was related to her. The king took off his signet ring, which he had reclaimed from Haman, and presented it to Mordecai. And Esther appointed him over Haman's estate. Esther again pleaded with the king, falling at his feet and weeping. She begged him to put an end to the evil plan of Haman the Agagite, which he had devised against the Jews. Then the king extended the gold scepter to Esther, and she arose and stood before him. If it pleases the king, she said, and if he regards me with favor and thinks it's the right thing to do, and if he is pleased with me, let an order be written overruling the dispatches that Haman, son of Hamadatha the Agagite, devised and wrote to destroy the Jews in all the king's provinces. For how can I bear to see disaster fall on my people? How can I bear to see the destruction of my family? King Xerxes replied to Queen Esther and to Mordecai the Jew, because Haman attacked the Jews, I have given his estate to Esther, and they have impaled him on the pole he set up. Now write another decree in the king's name in behalf of the Jews as seems best to you, and seal it with the king's signet ring. For no document written in the king's name and sealed with his ring can be revoked. I truly believe that God has given each person on earth a purpose. He used ordinary people like Esther and Mordecai to save his people. Our basic purpose while on this earth is to love God and to love others. But he's such a creative God and has made each of us unique with different gifts and abilities that he doesn't stop there. He uses people's gifts to champion the cause of sex trafficking. He uses people's gifts to love on kids through sports. He uses people's gifts to go to other countries and tell them about Jesus. He uses people's gifts to share hospitality through a meal. 
And he uses people's gifts to make amazing art that reflects back to our creator. And the list can just go on and on there. So I have this video that I want to share with you about an elementary school friend of mine. And this is the story of her son, Austin. God put in his young heart a desire to do something that was really very simple, but it turned into a life-changing event for the kids in Zambia. He was only nine when God gave him his purpose. So let's watch this video and see how far it's gone. Well, in 2004, I had seen a video talking about a girl who lost her parents due to AIDS, and I learned that there are 15 million kids just like her. I was very much so moved to action just because I realized that we do have a lot more here, and you don't really realize that, I guess, until you, until you look around and you see that there are people who are a lot less fortunate than us. As a nine-year-old, I didn't know what I could do to make a difference, and we kind of looked around, and there was nothing for, for kids to do. And so I was just encouraged to start something of my own and to use my favorite sport to make a difference. And that's kind of how Hoops of Hope came into play. I decided to shoot baskets and raise money, kind of like a, a walkathon. Kids will go out and they'll get sponsors, you know, from their friends, their family, their grandparents, and then they'll come together on one day and shoot their hoops. That very first event, I actually, it was just me shooting hoops. And I had found out that every 14 seconds, another one of these children is orphaned because of HIV and AIDS. And I learned that 2,057 kids are actually orphaned during my school day. So that's how many shots I decided to shoot that day was 2,057. And I hoped to raise that much money as well. And it turns out that I raised about $3,000 that very first year. After I had done that first event that first year, I realized that a lot of other kids would want to participate. Pretty soon the idea caught on. In the six years that Hoops of Hope has been going on, we've had about 40,000 people shoot free throws with us in over 20 different countries, and we've been able to raise about $2 million, all to provide a school, two medical clinics, four dormitories, a whole water project in Kenya, basically just to help ease the light for these kids, and, and our whole purpose is to help those who are orphaned by AIDS. I'll tell you what, there are, there are children with their parents today, there are people that are alive today, uh, there are children that have a hope for a future today because of Austin and Hoops of Hope and all the thousands of kids that have just stepped up to the free throw line and take, have given it their best shot. I can't imagine how one person can be able to change the life of many, many people uh, in this country. A big thank you to Hoops of Hope for saving the people of Snazongwe, for saving life for the Zambians, for sav saving life for the majority in this area. I absolutely believe that, that kids have the power to change the world. Not only that, I believe that they have the power to do it now. That they don't have to wait to be a certain age to make a difference, that they can do something now. It's a great story and um, that was done a couple of years ago and he's now married and has a family and they've raised over $4 million now to further building um, schools and dormitories for those kids there. God used Austin, an ordinary nine-year-old kid, to do some extraordinary things. And as, as I think back over the story of Esther and how God used an ordinary Jewish girl, I'm amazed. But I'm amazed even more how God can use us, you and me, for his purposes right now. We are ordinary people, but we have an extraordinarily creative God who wants to have a relationship with us and longs to use us to help grow his kingdom. Maybe he's given you a dream that you've not started pursuing yet out of fear. Maybe you failed at some things along the way. Maybe you are fully engaged in pursuing your goals and dreams right now that God's given you. Wherever you're at, he has a purpose for you. He's put you in this place, in this time, in this city, with your family and your sphere of influence for such a time as this. God will raise up others to fulfill his purpose if you aren't. But what joy, peace, and satisfaction comes from doing what God has designed you to do and what he has called you to do for such a time as this. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for who you are and the purposes that you've given each one of us in our life to fulfill. I pray that you would help us to be courageous and brave to begin that journey of fulfilling those purposes and to give strength to those who are still con continuing on the purposes that God has given them. We thank you for your love and your grace in this time.
Your name I pray. Amen.